And good evening, church. So thankful that you're here with me tonight to uh, study the Word of God one more time. Tonight we're in Colossians. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. You know, how do you realize the growth in your life? You, you come to Jesus Christ by faith. You believe. You pray the prayer. You repent. How does spiritual growth work? That's a question we're going to get to tonight. I trust God's answer for us is going to be impacting our hearts that we might learn how to live in obedience to him. But before we get to that tonight, I want to just spend one quick second talking to you about what happens on the first Wednesday night of each month. We have an issues and answers session where if if you have issues or questions about spiritual things that you want a biblical perspective on, uh, you can submit those questions in the comments below, or you can email them to Pastor Scott at welcometolivinghope.com, and we'll do our best to get our Bibles out and give you a strong biblical answer for whatever your question may be. But until we get there, we're going to look at Colossians, and tonight specifically Colossians 3. Let me pray for us before we begin. Father God, by your power... I know you can make your word come alive to us. By your spirit, you can help us understand, and not just understand, Lord, but you can help us apply these things to our lives that we might be the people of God you've called us to be. Not like the hypocrites who say they believe but then don't live well, but people that follow you in spirit and in truth. Please have mercy on us and give us the strength to live out our lives in obedience to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start tonight by talking about babies. Think about a baby. A baby doesn't have to make any effort to grow. If you feed the baby, if you nurture the baby, the baby's growth is automatic. You don't have to say, well, okay, this week we're going to work on the leg because the leg looks a little short. We're going to try to get that to grow this week. As if you and I had the power to impact that at all. No. You just care for the baby. The growth of the baby happens naturally. Spiritual growth is not like that. By God's design, we come to Jesus Christ by faith. We ask him to enter our hearts. We want to serve him as Lord of all. But that doesn't mean we're going to grow spiritually. Yes, the Spirit enters us, and the Spirit wants us to walk in his power. He wants us to learn from him. He wants to guide our lives. But remember, Paul says things like, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He says, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. There's a way for you and I to have prayed the prayer and entered into relationship, but then ignore the steps we need to take to grow. And that's what our passage is going to point us to today. We're going to see both negative things that we're supposed to get rid of in our lives and positive things that we're supposed to adopt if we want to grow and be sanctified in our daily lives. It's so critical for us to get a hold of this because this may be exactly what is impeding your growth in Christ. Maybe you're one of those let go and let God kind of people that you, you feel like, well, I prayed the prayer, now God's going to take care of the rest. I don't have to do anything. Well, you don't have to do anything in terms of saving yourself. Only God saves us. It's by faith in Christ. But we do have to participate. We do have to make effort to grow. Let me show you what I mean. You look at Romans 12.1. It's a very familiar passage. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to do what? Here's something I want you to do. That's what Paul's telling us. Present your bodies as living, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what's he saying? Hey, don't just say, I prayed the prayer, that's good enough. Offer yourself to God, Lord I'm yours. I'm going to die to myself. That's what sacrifices do, right? That's the imagery of sacrifice, death. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to live to do what you've called me to do. I will present my body to you. 
That's one place it says it, but watch at all these places. When, when Peter's writing his second letter, what does he say? For this very reason, do what? Make every effort. Work. Try. Pursue. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. And he goes through a whole list of things that he wants us to pursue. But tonight, I just want you to see the thrust of the passage in 2 Peter 1.5 is try, pursue, actively go after. It's not sit back, let go, let God. I'm going to be the person God wants me to be if I just relax. No, no. God's encouragement to us is always, I want you to grow. Look at this in Romans 6. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, in other words, you guys used to be slaves to sin and lost in sin, so now... Now what? Now that you know Jesus Christ and you've been born again, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Here's something we are asked to do, much like we saw a minute ago. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Okay, now present your members as slaves to righteousness. God's call on us is to pay attention to how we're living give ourselves to him and submit to his word to actively pursue our growth again let's look at another one in philippians 2 therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence what does he say work out your salvation with fear and trembling it's on you that's the point it's on you. You need to pursue your own spiritual growth by cooperating with God's Spirit as He leads you to obey His truth. It's not going to happen automatically. We are called to pursue Him, abide in Him, walk in the Spirit. That's the call that you and I have to get. We, You know, there's a lot of people out there that say, well, gee, I'm already okay with God because I prayed the prayer. I can live however I want now. There's no problem. Just, you know, I'll adopt whatever sinful lifestyle I think I deserve. And, and God's still going to love me. It's all okay. And he's going to bless me. And if you read these texts over and over and over, the New Testament is just full of passages that will tell us, yes, God has saved us, but he saved us to a new life. He hasn't saved us to the old ways. He, he doesn't want us to live in sin anymore. He has saved us to a new life. He's reconciled us to himself. And he wants us to be holy as he is holy. You know, in our culture, we think about being happy as the highest ideal. God says, no, the highest ideal is to be in Christ and be holy. That's the highest ideal for mankind. That would be where the most satisfaction, the most joy, the most peace can be found. In this passage, you see, for it is God who works in you. I want you to see in 13, God is inside of you if you've come to Jesus Christ by faith. He is working, but he's asking you, he's asking all of us to cooperate with him as he transforms us into a holy lifestyle. He wants to will and to work his good pleasure in us. That's the point. You see, the scripture would clearly tell us, look, if you've come to Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are brand new in Christ. You've been regenerated if you've come to him by faith. If you belong to him, then the old is passed away. The new has come. Do you see this here? The new is here. We're, we're not two natures anymore. God has filled us with his spirit and we have died to that old nature. Now we have um, remnants of that old nature in us. We still uh, follow sin instead of follow God from time to time. But in the end, God has said, look, you've died in Christ. So before we get to Colossians 3 tonight, I just want you to see 
how important it is to have the right mindset as we go into this. We need to do something. We need to actively pursue God and righteousness. And we'll see how he's outlined that for us in a minute. But before we get there, I just want to reemphasize this one thing. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That old nature, that sinful nature, that one that disobeyed God at any moment for any reason, that's gone. God has done a work in you if you've submitted your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're willing to obey his word, God has is, is changed you. It's already happened. You can read Hebrews 10, 14. He, he is... Um, he, through one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. That's total sanctification from God's standpoint. Those who are being made holy. That's our struggle. That we are being made holy every day. We have choices to make. God reiterates to us over and over, I want you to make the choice to pursue a holy lifestyle in me. Remember Romans 6, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? His death. When we lowered ourselves in the water, the preacher lowered us and brought us out, symbolically we were saying, I'm dying dying to myself right here. No more my self-sufficiency. No more my bucket list. No more my desires. I'm here to serve Christ We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might, what? Walk in newness of life. That's what the death to ourselves is all about, that we might walk in newness of life. There you see it, the practical application of the death we experience. So, have you got that? You're responsible for your spiritual growth in the sense that you're called by God, commanded by God, to pursue your spiritual growth. That's the call on all of us. That's why Jesus said, look, abide in me. Pursue me. Seek me. You're going to find me. Abide in me. That's where the spiritual fruit gets produced through our lives when we abide in him. All right, so now let's go to Colossians chapter 3. I'm not going to read every verse again for you, but let's just remember what he said in verse 1. We were told as part of the transformation that God seeks in us that we should seek the things that are above. I'll let you go back to last week if you want to see that discussed again but just read your bible that's what you're called to do you're a believer seek the things that are above you're a believer set your minds on the things that are above in verse 2 that was the point think about who god is what god's done what you're called to do don't don't set your mind on earthly things again Realize the transformation that God has produced in your life. You're not the same person. He has transformed us from the inside out through the power of his spirit. We're not going to set our goals like earthly um, unbelieving people might set them. My, My goal is to not have the biggest 401k among all my friends so that when I die with millions of dollars, somebody else can spend it for me. No, my goal is to serve Christ every day. Whether I have a 401k or not, um, you know, I might pursue that to some level, but the the point being, uh, my main priority is to do what God wants me to do. That's how I keep my mind away from earthly things. I keep focusing on the things that are above. I keep pursuing the things that are above. This is what God has called all of us to do. And then he comes in with a list, you remember, of things we're not supposed to do. Verses 5 through 9 of chapter 3. Put to death what is earthly in you. Oh, let's get direct, Paul. What do you want us to do? Well, get rid of sexual immorality. Get rid of impurity. Get rid of passion. 
Get rid of evil desire. Get rid of covetousness and idolatry. Get rid of anger. Get rid of wrath. Get rid of malice and slander and obscene talk. And stop lying to each other. Look at that list, would you? That's a bunch of negativity. Get these things out of your life. You know, the Lord doesn't seem to be much into um, group discussion about how we can help each other. Although the body of Christ does come together to help each other, hold each other accountable. The command of God is, hey, quit it. Depend on my spirit and give up your desires to do these things. You say, I can't control myself. Well, you know, the Bible says that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Yes, you can if you'll submit your life to him and seek his help. Yes, you can control yourself. You can control your tongue. You can control anger, not in your own strength, but in the strength of the Spirit of God who's in you. That's the call. So there's the negative part. Here comes a positive thing. Paul in verse 10 says, look, put on the new self, renewed in knowledge. In fact, let's look at that a little bit more closely. He says, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. Here's something I really want you to catch. How does the new self, this transformation that God has put us in, he's done for us, how is it realized? Yes, we participate with God. Yes, we pursue. Yes, he's talking about putting on a new self. In other words, live out what you are inside. Make what transformation God has done in your heart visible through your behavior, through your attitudes, through your speech. Be transformed. That's the call of the passage. And what does he say? Put on the new self. Well, how does my new self become the person I'm called to be? It's being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What's he talking about here? Because this is a really crucial thing to think about, church. He's talking about know what I've said. Know, knowledge, right? There's this thing called epistemology. The same root word is the word here for knowledge. What does it mean? It means that if I want to actually realize the new life that God has put inside of me, the new creation that I am, I have to know who God is. I had to have to know his word. I have to know what he's revealed about himself. And I have to know it for the purpose of renewing myself in terms of my own thinking, that I will set my mind on things that are above. And I have to know it in the sense of, obedience, that I will obey him. Knowledge is key. And where do we get our knowledge of God? Well, the lion's share of our knowledge of God comes from his word. Yes, we know him personally. Yes, we grow as we have experience with him. But the root of knowledge is his word. Jesus is the word. We have to look at the Bible. In other words, how much time, effort do you expend on understanding who God is based on his word? So critical. Paul says, look, part of the transformation we go through as we become people that are pursuing our own sanctification is we see each other as people who are in Christ. When you get here, when you're putting on the new self, there's not Greek and Jew. There's not circumcised and uncircumcised or barbarian and Scythian or slave and free. There are only people that are in Christ. Christ is the one who's elevated. He's in all and he is all. He is the one that has brought all of humanity together through faith in him. If we believe, it doesn't matter what our cultural differences are, we belong to him. What a transformation. So there's a social component to this new self that we're to put on. There's, there's the idea that we are united together with all believers who are honestly and authentically following Jesus Christ according to his word. That's a beautiful thing. Well, now we get some more instruction. What does he say? Look, I want you to put this on. 
Okay, there's another command for us to take action, like you would put on a jacket or put on a, a coat. This is the idea that you envelop yourself with what follows. Put on then as God's chosen ones. Oh, wow, stop. You see this? What's he telling us here? You're chosen by God. The reason you believe in Jesus is you've been elected by God to believe. The reason you know the Lord, you were predestined before the foundations of the world to believe, elected. Okay, you've come to him. You are God's chosen one. In other words, there's really no reason at all for you not to follow him by pursuing your sanctification to realize the new self that he has transformed you into. Get rid of those old behaviors as we just talked about and now put these things on. You are God's chosen. You are holy in God's sight. You are beloved in God's sight. This should be great motivation for us to pursue these things. What should we pursue? What does he say? Here's one thing he wants to put, wants us to put on. Put on a compassionate heart. Think about that, church. <laughs> the world we live in, wow. Somebody that really cares? Somebody that gives a care? Are you serious? We live in a very, very hostile world. We live in a world where people don't care at all. At least some. There's still some that do. One of the characteristics of this new self is for us to have compassion. We care. If you're not okay, we're not okay. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be helping you. You're supposed to be helping us when we're down. I mean, this is the idea. We care. Compassion. Who's the greatest example of compassion? It's the Lord Jesus himself, right? He's the one that comes to us and says, I, I'll lay my life down for you because I realize you cannot escape the wrath of God unless I am punished on your behalf. I will die for you because I care. I want you to be with me forever. I will sacrifice myself on your behalf. Compassionate hearts. Do you care? Well, if your answer in society is, look, it's a tough world and I'm just trying to make it, what are you saying? You're not trusting God. Compassionate hearts are part of the makeup of the new self. Put on the new self. Put on a compassionate heart. You say, but I really don't care. Well, then ask yourself if you really know God. Because if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if his spirit really lives in you, then he will generate the fact of caring for other people. Maybe you should start praying for people and seeking God's best for people. When you see them, maybe that compassion will develop. But God says part of the new way, if we're going to live authentically before him, if we're going to put on the new self, we have to be people that care. He also says we have to be people that are kind. Put on kindness. In other words, be nice. This is one I struggle with, especially if you're the third um, telemarketer that's interrupting my dinner. <laughs> it's hard to be kind. Help us, God. But God says, if you're going to put on the new self and walk with me, then part of your adjustment in the way you act and think is to have kindness, to, to care about what your impact is on somebody else and to help others. Here's another big one, humility. I mean, we live in a world that the self is, is built up as never before. You know, me, 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 my phone, my iPhone, my iPad. It's all about me. My whole world is about what I think. We even go so far as to say we have the capacity to generate our own mor moral system because if, if I think something's right and God's Word says it's not right, well, it doesn't matter what God says because I think my morality is the way to go. So I'm obviously going to be right and sincere in what I think and I'll just reject what God says about his moral standard. I mean, we are all about our pride. But in the end, Paul is telling the Colossians, God is telling us through his word, if you want to follow me, if you want to develop, 
and spiritually grow, you have got to adopt humility. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he raises up the humble. He, he strikes the pride down. This is the word of the Lord. He wants us to be submissive to him. Humble. Who do you think you are? I'm a sinner saved by grace. If it wasn't for the grace of God in my life, I would have nothing, nothing to show, nothing to follow, no goodness. If it wasn't for him in me, I would be completely lost. And, and Paul goes on down the list to say, look, here's something else you can do. Adopt an attitude of meekness. You know, meek isn't weak. Meek is a submitted attitude to Jesus Christ to say, I will follow you. It's not that God's calling us to be a doormat, but we are called to give up what is rightfully ours in order to accomplish God's will. Meekness, so important. And God says, look, in verse 12 here, the last one, I want you to be patient. Oh, this is a hard one. Have you ever prayed for patience? You know, if you've ever prayed for patience, you realize that that's one of the most dangerous prayers you can pray because God's going to continually put you in a situation where you can't fix it, you can't change it, and you have to wait. <laughs> that's how God deals with us when we ask him for patience. But guess what? Here we see it. God says, put this on. I want you to be compassionate. I want you to be kind. I want you to have humility. I want you to have weakness. And I want you to have patience. Notice that these things are, are exactly the character of God, that he demonstrates all these things to us, that we are called to be his. Exercise patience. As the passage moves forward, bear with one another. Oh, now we're getting into social situations. So these attitudes of compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, patience now they spill over into our interaction with others that I'm supposed to care about you enough, you're supposed to care about me enough, that we help each other in our own weaknesses. And if one has a complaint against another, okay, there's been some violation, there's been some trouble, some conflict, how can you live in a group of people and never see conflict? No, you're going to see it. But what happens if you're putting on the new self? You forgive each other. Wow. You forgive each other. You say, okay, you made that mistake or I made that mistake. Let's reconcile. In modern times, forgiveness is in short supply. What do we do instead? Well, if you watch the nightly news, you'll say, well, I guess you shoot each other. I mean, every night we have a list of who got shot over what. What kind of fight erupted where somebody got a gun out and started shooting. Paul says, look, if you're going to be part of the um, sanctified followers of Jesus Christ, you need to pursue these things that we've talked about. And when conflict comes, you need to forgive. Why? Well, as the Lord has forgiven you, do you see that? You know, God knows how much uh, we sin. He knows how our hearts are corrupt. And he still says, look, I love you, I'll die for you, and I forgive you. How can we say anything less to the people that hurt us, to the people that have conflict with us. Here we are in 313 being taught to forgive. And in fact, not just taught, but do you see that the Lord has forgiven us? It says, so you also must forgive. That we would be characterized by forgiveness as we put on this new self that we're talking about here in Colossians 3. Forgiveness is an essential part of our maturity in Christ. And now Paul expands again, above all these things, what? Put on love. In other words, if you want to know the highest priority, it's love. Put that on. Not love that says, oh, I feel a warm, fuzzy feeling towards somebody because we know we won't feel that towards everybody. That's, that's romantic love. That's based... In, in large measure on emotion. But when God loves us, what does he do? He gives his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He takes action on our behalf that's not based on how lovely we are. 
No, it's based on his character. And so when we're told here, above all these things put on love, we're being told it's not dependent on the character or the behavior of somebody else. It's, de it's dependent on the character of God. We love each other as God loves us. And what happens? Which binds everything together in perfect harmony. If we really are characterized by love, conflict among us might still arise, but it'll be met with forgiveness, reconciliation, and harmony instead of division. Super, super important to understand that in, in putting on the new self, we're called to love one another. But I do want to make a point here. When it tells us to love one another, um, certainly we need to have compassion and we need to be meek and humble and we need to pursue forgiveness when offense has occurred. But he's not talking about doctrine here. In other words, we're not called to be all together in perfect harmony if there's somebody that's bringing lies into the fellowship. If, if somebody's saying, well, Jesus isn't the Christ, his death means nothing, or you have to add works to your salvation, or if there are some obviously unbiblical um, things being stated, we have to back up and say, now, wait a minute. We are still tied to God's word. We are still absolutely submitted in submission to what he has said. And so if you're bringing something that is unbiblical into the fellowship, well, we'll still love you in the sense that we'll pray that God opens your eyes to the truth and saves your soul. But we are not going to stay together in terms of one big happy family and entertain these false ideas. That's probably a whole nother sermon. But in the end, here talking within the fellowship and talking about putting on the new self, Paul's right when he says, look, when you love one another, you're going to experience perfect harmony with one another. And as he moves forward from there in the next verse, he says, look, I want you to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Notice that word rule. I want you to be subject to what Christ wants. I want your heart to be ruled by God. I want your heart to be ruled by his word. I want his peace to be all over you, but you have to be in a situation where you're submitting to his rule. He is the king. You know, what do kings do? They rule. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. You know, we live in America, most of us that watch these. And, and what does that mean for us? Well, we're independent. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want, just because we want. We're very un, um, unhappy about submitting ourselves to somebody's rule. Somebody tells us to do something, oh, no way, I'm not doing that. Even if I think it's the right thing to do, I might still resist because who do you think you are that you could tell me what to do. I mean, just look at our country when it comes to vaccinations. You know, what what's happening among us? That we won't take medicine based on the fact that somebody told us to. We have an independent spirit. Well, in the Bible, those of us who belong to Jesus Christ, we're told to submit to his rule. Submit to his rule. You know, what does that two-year-old say when you reprimand him? Hey, you're not the boss of me. Well, guess what? In many ways, we tell Jesus that very same statement. We're, you're not the boss of us. We're still going to do what we want, even though we've said we love you and want to follow you. Paul says, no, I want God's peace to be in you. I want your life to be ruled by his peace in him, in which... To which indeed you were called. Again, God has called us to live like this. In one body, I want you to be thankful. That's the lesson here. What is putting on the new self all about? Well, let's let this verse go and we'll summarize. Here in verse 316, Paul says what? I want you to let the word of Christ, in other words, what God has to say, what he's revealed in his word, I want you to let everything he's said 
to dwell in you richly. You say, Pastor, I don't have time to read my Bible. I'm busy. I don't have time to sit down and meditate on his word. I have things to do. I have to check my email. I have to write texts to my friends. I have to work. I, I just don't have time for God. Well, understand, if you're going to put on the new self, if you're going to pursue God in the way that he's called us to pursue him, then you're going to change. You're going to make time. You're going to sit down with that Bible and you're going to learn it. Why? Because that's the call. If we are going to put on the new self and realize the holy lifestyle that God has called to manifest the transformation that he's already done in our hearts, well, then we have got to understand what he said. Remember when Jesus was telling us to become or to make disciples in Matthew 28, what did he say? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the idea of bringing people into baptism after God has changed their hearts. Okay. But then he says, teach them to obey all that I've commanded. What does that mean? That means we have to learn what he said. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. For what purpose? Teach them to obey all I've commanded. To obey. That's how discipleship works. That's how putting on this new self works. That's what we're supposed to pursue. That we would let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And here's some of the benefits that come to us when we pursue those things. We teach each other. We admonish each other. What does that mean? Let's look at God's word and see what it says. Let's look at how I'm living and see what I'm doing. And let's see if those things match up. Why? Not out of I'm holier than you and I'm going to tell you how to live. No, out of I want you to realize your full potential in Christ. And that means you need to pursue him according to what he said. This is the word of God to us. We're going to teach each other. We're going to admonish each other in all wisdom. What does that point us to? The word of God. Where is wisdom to be found? It's found in what God has said. Are you smarter than God? I'm not. What do we do if we want godly wisdom? We look to God's word. What has he said? That's how we determine where wisdom is. And he says, you know, in terms of worship, sing. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, there's a freedom to worship God in this place where you're putting on the new self. You realize you're forgiven. You realize you're reconciled. You realize that as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit, he's using your life to glorify the name of Jesus through your everyday life and circumstances. It's a wonderful thing. You sing, sing psalms, sing hymns, sing spiritual songs. Let your heart rejoice before the Lord and with thankfulness in your hearts. We become people of gratitude. These are the benefits of putting on the new self. We, we say, thank you, God. Thank you for letting us live today. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for filling us with your spirit. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for being who you are. And thank you for the future that you have for us through the mercy and grace that you've provided in Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just hard not to be overwhelmed with thankfulness if you're thinking right, if you've set your mind on things above. When you set your mind on things of this earth, it's easy not to be thankful. Oh God, why is my life like it is? But if you get away from that and set your mind on things that are above, God transforms your heart as you pursue the things we've just talked about. Whatever you do, in word or deed, in other words, whatever you say, whatever actions you take, do everything. This is the call for those of us that want to put on the new self. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, in obedience to him, in line with who he is, in submission to his word, in the name of the Lord Jesus, here it is again, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There it is. Here's giving thanks twice in two verses. All right. This is the attitude of putting on the new self. This is what God's calling us to, church. Hallelujah. Let's summarize it. All the way back to verse 1. Seek the things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above. And 
Don't set your mind on earthly things. That's what God's calling us to. Here's the list. Here are the things to get rid of in your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, that passion. That's the kind of idea where you just want to get what you want to get for yourself. Get rid of evil desire. Get rid of covetousness and idolatry and anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. Get rid of lying to each other. Those are all the negatives, the things that we have to abandon. What do we have to adopt? Put on the new self. And how do we do that? We're renewed in knowledge. And what does that mean? We're renewed in our understanding of the Word of God as we pursue His truth. That new self lives as it's called to live. And how is it? Well, here's what He told us. Put on a compassionate heart. Put on kindness. Put on meekness. Put on patience. Bear with one another when trouble comes. Forgive one another when there's conflict. Put on love above all. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And while all that's happening, be thankful. You want to know how to put on the new self? Well, Colossians 3 might not have every last detail about how to do it. But I can tell you this. If we master these 15 things we've just listed out, We'll be well on our way to putting on the new self and living as God has called us to live. I want to remind you, church, for those that may not know, uh, in the morning, 7 a.m. Monday through Friday, we have daily devotions uh, right here where you're watching this. Either the YouTube page or the Facebook page are available for you. Um, If you'd like to join us, we would love to have you and see you there. Church. As we dismiss tonight, I want you to just ask yourself, am I actively pursuing putting on the new self? Or am I one of those that's just sitting back? Hey, I said the prayer. I believe in Jesus. I don't have to change anything. Remember what God said. Remember what the admonition to us tonight is all about. And love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray it's so for all of us. God bless you, church. Serve him well.